everyone, it's Chris here and welcome to another episode of Urbex. I'm here in Detroit at the Fisher plant, plant number 21. And we're going to explore every inch of this building and see what is inside. So join me as we take a look inside the Fisher body plant number 21. Fisher Body's beginnings trace back to a horse-drawn carriage shop in Newark, Ohio in the late 1800s that was started by Lawrence P. Fisher. In 1904 and 1905, the two eldest brothers, Fred and Charles, came to Detroit, where their uncle, Albert Fisher, had established the Standard Wagon Works during the latter part of the 1800s. The brothers found work at the C.R. Wilson Company, a manufacturer of horse-drawn carriage bodies that was beginning to make bodies for the automotive manufacturers. With financing from their uncle on July 22, 1908, Fred and Charles Fisher established the Fisher Body Company. Eventually, their uncle wanted out of the industry, and the brothers would obtain the needed funds from a local Detroit businessman named Louis Mendelssohn, who became a shareholder and director. Within a short period of time, Charles and Fred Fisher brought their five younger brothers into the business. Prior to forming the company, Fred Fisher had been building the bodies of the Cadillac Ocella at the C.R. Wilson Company, and starting in 1910, Fisher became the supplier of all closed bodies for Cadillac and Buick. In the early years of the company, the Fisher brothers had to develop new designs because the horseless carriage bodies did not have the strength to withstand the vibrations of the new motor cars. By 1913, the Fisher Body Company had the capacity to produce 100,000 cars per year. At this point, they were making bodies for Ford, Crit, Chalmers, Cadillac, and Studebaker. Riding off of the highly successful plants in Detroit, they decided to expand into Canada, setting up a plant in Walkerville, Ontario. By 1914, their operations had grown to become the world's largest manufacturer of auto bodies. One of the reasons for their wild success was the development of the interchangeable wooden body parts that did not require hand fitting, as was the case with the construction of the older carriages. This would require the new design of precision woodworking tools. In 1916, the company became the Fisher Body Corporation, and its capacity was 370,000 bodies per year. By this point, they were making bodies for Abbott, Buick, Cadillac, Chalmers, Chandler, Chevrolet, Church Field, Elmore, EMF, Ford, Hershoff, Hudson, Crit, Oldsmobile, Packard, Regal, and Studebaker. The company constructed the now-abandoned Albert Kahn-designed Fisher Body Plant No. 21 on Paquette Street in Detroit in 1919, which is the exact building that we'll be exploring in today's video. At the time, the company had more than 40 buildings encompassing over 3,700,000 square feet of floor space. This included Fisher Body Plant West Fort and Livernois, Fisher Body Plant No. 2, St. Antoine, the Fisher Body Plant No. 4, Oakland Avenue, the Fisher Body Plant No. 12, 1961 East Milwaukee Street, the Fisher Body Plant 18, the Fisher Body Plant 21 at 700 Paquette, the Fisher Body Plant 23 at 601 Paquette, and the Fisher Plant 37 at 950 East Milwaukee at Hastings. In 1919, a deal was put together by President William C. Durant and General Motors bought 60% of the company. The Fisher Body Company purchased Fleetwood Metal Body in 1925 and in 1926 was integrated entirely as an in-house coach building division of General Motors. During World War II, the Fisher Body plants would be used for building military vehicles such as Jeeps and tanks. Fisher Body would remain the largest auto body manufacturer until 1984 when the division was dissolved with some of its plants being taken over by the newly created Fisher Guide Division, later Inland Fisher Guide, and the remaining facilities were absorbed by other GM operations. Operations at many of the Fisher body plants may have ceased long ago as they sit rotting away, but the name continues on with divisions such as Fisher Dynamics.
I grew up in Detroit, only having moved back in 2013, and I'm sure a lot of you probably will find it hard to believe that I've never been in any of the abandoned buildings in Detroit, and really, this is my first major urban exploration. I've always been hesitant about going into these large abandoned places, not really for the fact that it's dangerous or anything, that doesn't bother me so much, you know, just use common sense and be careful, but mostly for the fact that it's sort of an unknown as to whether you'll get in trouble legally or not for going into any of these places. I mean, obviously, you use sense, and if it says no trespassing, then obviously you don't go in and you don't enter. But when it's just a large abandoned building like this one that has no signs and is just left wide open, it's kind of, you know, a gray area. The Fisher Body Plant number 21 is absolutely massive, and you can tell just how large it is by these aerial shots. It covers an impressive 600,000 square feet. Getting in this building wasn't very difficult. If you walk down the main sidewalk, although it's very overgrown, there's actually a doorway to the left or right, depending on which direction you're coming from, and you can easily just walk right inside. Exploring this large building gives you a very eerie, abandoned, apocalyptic kind of feeling. And I also have to say, I kind of felt like at any moment something was going to pop out at me, like a person or... I, I don't know, it just got like this really weird feeling like, someone was there even though I knew there was no one else there except for the few people that were exploring the building along with me. So this is the first thing that you'll see once you walk through that doorway that I mentioned a moment ago. That doorway leads into a few very narrow hallways which then lead into the main floor of the factory. This section that you're looking at caught fire back in 2014 causing the tower to collapse. Luckily, Detroit firefighters arrived on the scene and put out the blaze, saving the building from destruction. Whoa, look at all the shiny tile work. I believe these were either bathrooms or locker rooms for the employees to change in, but I'm not really quite sure. These stairs are terrifying. They seem quite sturdy, but not having a railing is super unsettling, and I had to climb at least four flights of these, if not more. This is one of the middle floors, and unfortunately I wasn't able to get out there because there was only a small hole cut in the door and I couldn't climb through it. Everything from here on out is either the top floor or the roof. And I was not expecting to find this amazing graffiti up here and even some machinery that was left behind. It's just super cool.
in this room I came across a large stone object that almost resembled like a wheel or a large cup, but I'm not sure what it is. If anyone knows, please let me know in the comments down below. So these are the tracks where the various body panels would have moved along and allowed the workers to assemble the cars. And I have seen some old documentaries where these tracks are actually in use and it's really cool to get to see them in operation.
Aw, oh, no way. I can't believe this is still here. This is one of those floor sweepers that they would have used to clean the factory floors. So these are the tunnels where they would have tested and inspected the car bodies before they left the factory. And this large tunnel that you'll see here in a moment, well that was the water tunnel and they would spray water at the car bodies as they passed through checking for any leaks. Toledo, Ohio, it's easy to know a loser with no place to go. So ride your bike to this weird town where everyone's a loser and all the buildings burn down. Well, that about does it for another episode of Urbex. You know, growing up in Detroit, I really miss living there. You know, I grew up there in the 90s and 2000s, and I know most people think pretty poorly of Detroit, but it's been through some really hard times, and it's beginning to come back. And I highly recommend that if you haven't given this great city a try, you should visit it someday and see all that it has to offer. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Well, hopefully one day I'll make it back to Detroit and be able to live there again. But for now, I'll just be taking some day trips up to Detroit to film things to show my amazing viewers. As always, don't forget to smash that bell icon and hit that subscribe button and stay up to date on all the latest videos here at Tilted Tripod Media and on Urbex. Thank you and I'll see you again in the next video.